Okay, let's get going. Um, welcome everybody. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the many countries on which we're meeting today and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. Today I'm speaking from the lands of the Bidwell people um, and I pay my respects, well, we, we pay our respects to the First Nations elders past, present and emerging across Australia and extend that respect to the First Nations people who are joining us today. So my name's Justine Clark, um, I'm from Parla, and I'm really thrilled to welcome you to uh, the first online salon of 2021. And I'd particularly like to thank Alison McFadgen and Emma Healy who've uh, taken on oversight of the salon program and particularly the online program and are really helping us drive it forward, which is just fantastic. Um, I also want to acknowledge the ongoing and deep support of AWS, our parlour partner who make the whole salon program possible, and um, our other wonderful partners as well. And I know we've got people here from Brickworks who um, host many of our in-person salons around the country, and uh, we love them, so thank you. Um, and Melbourne University, whose Zoom account we're using tonight, so who are also um, hosts for this event. So um, many of you have been to salons before and as most of you know, the aim is really to provide a very friendly and informal space for people to get together. We want to connect people in architecture and the built environment at different stages of their careers and lives and to sort of um, establish this sort of theme or this idea, we always stage a short public conversation between two women who are themselves at different points in their own careers. Um, and tonight we've done a bit of matchmaking and we have Sarah Aldridge and Alan Buttrose who uh, we think will have, um, have a, you know, a lot to say to each other and um, that will manage to stage a very enjoyable conversation for us all. As I've um, explained to them and explained to many people in the past, it's kind of like you're getting to know each other in the pub, only there's an audience of uh, a fair few people there enjoying your conversation with you. So now I'd just like to throw to Ali McFadgen, um, my colleague who is going to introduce our speakers. So thank you, Ellen and Sarah for joining us tonight. Firstly, I'll introduce Ellen, who is a registered architect in Queensland and Victoria with experience in architecture practices also across South Australia, Victoria and Queensland. Ellen sits on the sustainability committee for the Queensland chapter of the AIA and recently received the Emerging Architect Prize for Queensland in 2020, which was an amazing achievement. She has experience in community engagement from her time working with ODASA, the Office of Design and Architecture in South Australia, where she worked on major public projects and on community-based advocacy projects called Project Tag. Ellen's also worked previously in Melbourne, uh, at Six Degrees, uh, where she largely worked on institutional, cultural and civil, uh, civic projects, uh, which focused on the public interface and human-centred experience. Moving on to Sarah. Since founding Space Studio in 2008, Sarah's worked within the Byron Bay community to design and deliver buildings of high quality that are very much of their place. Her extensive design and project management experience gained from working across a broad range of project types in Europe and Japan has provided her with a higher level of expertise in client liaison and understanding of complex projects and the importance of community consultation. Sarah also, was also an associate professor teaching climate appropriate design professional practice and design studio at Bond University and has been involved in a wide range of pro bono work over the years, which might come up in the discussion uh, this evening. So I'd like to hand it over to both Sarah and Ellen, um, and thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Ali. Thanks, Ali. Hi, Ellen. Hi, Hi Sarah. Sarah. Hi. <laughs> nice to meet you here in the uh, palace view. Yes, I know. It's lovely, isn't it? It feels like a really lovely place to be, actually. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the, the parlour pub, <laughs> the parlour studio. Yes, <laughs> I know. It should be a regular thing, mm -hmm. regular weekly thing. Definitely, definitely, yeah, yeah. So, so Ellen, should we kick off 
ask, I'm going to ask you first, Ellen. Um, how did you choose architecture and has the journey been what you thought it would be? Uh, um, I was convinced I wasn't going to be an architect. I have a family <laughs> with a fair few architects in them and I was like, no, not for me. I'm not working that hard. I am <laughs> having a life. Uh, no, um, that's not for me. But then I uh, took some time out between, and uh, in deciding what I wanted to do and my mum gave me some good advice and I was looking at going into health and she was like, look, I, maybe it's um, advisable to do something where your skill set lies so you can you know, help the world in that way rather than, uh, rather than it's pushing something uphill. So that was very sound advice and kind of some time away from all of my architect families came back and was like, yeah, actually, no, I think I can use this as a tool to um, work in the, in the spheres that I want to with, with humans, with people, but just actually um, in a different way. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm definitely glad that I, I chose that path. I started in Cairns. I'm now in Cairns, but I've then um, studied in South Australia and worked in South Australia and then moved over to Melbourne and I'm now back up here. And, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely uh, definitely glad I made the the trot around and chose architecture yeah how about you Sarah what about you yeah well that's quite funny actually Ellen I didn't know that about you but I didn't choose architecture either well there you go yeah <laughs> no I was going to be a civil engineer because I just wanted to use as much concrete as possible so I thought that you know if I just did bridges and things I would just get get more than my fair share of concrete so I was I was quite convinced I was going to be a civil engineer and um, applied to universities, got placed at Southampton University, which is, you know, considered to be very strong in engineering. And and similar to you, my mum was kind of in my ear and saying, I don't think you should do that. I don't think you should do that. And I was like, why? You know, kind of bursting with feminism at the age of 17. Why don't you think I should do engineering? And she just said, because you have a memory for colour and I don't think engineering is going to use your memory for colour. And I was like, oh. I didn't even know that was a thing. And um, yeah, so then I withdrew from that and applied to the Bartlett at University of London and got in, you know, knowing nothing about architecture um, and just had a great time there and really, really enjoyed it. So um, yeah, from, and it was, you know, as you might imagine, incredibly intense and, you know, really interesting, but yeah, that's, so I, I sort of, I don't know, came in through the back door as well, I guess, in a yeah, certain yeah. way, roundabout journey. Um, I don't know whether it's what I thought it would be. I'm not sure I had any preconceptions about what it would be. Um, I probably wouldn't have anticipated that I would now be living in Australia and, you know, sort of running my own practice. I, I assumed I would, I guess I assumed I'd probably stay in London and be working in one of the practices there. But yeah, it's kind of, I can't say I'm disappointed. Mm -hmm. so, so how did you end up in Byron Bay then? Because that's quite a transition from the Bartlett to Byron Bay to, and sounds like you've been a few places in between as well. It is, yeah. So I worked in London until 2007 and by that time I was married to an Australian, had two little kids. Um, so I'd been doing projects in all over the UK and France and Sweden and I did a project in Japan and all based in, in from London. And um, then we thought, oh, we'll go to, while well, the kids are young, um, we'll go to Australia for a year. And then we just kind of thought, oh, this is a bit stupid. Why don't we just go? So we just literally sold our house, packed everything into an enormous container and just came to Australia and bought a caravan and drove around Australia looking for somewhere to live. Um, and came to Byron Bay and just, just literally loved it. I went out for a run and I sort of got slightly lost trying to get up to the lighthouse and just came back exhausted just saying we've got to live here we've got to live here it's so beautiful <laughs> and so it was literally the natural beauty of Byron Bay that that um drew us here and and when I said to my mum oh we really we really like Byron Bay she said well that's funny because when you went to Byron Bay when you were 15 it was the only thing you kept from the whole trip was a little fridge magnet that said Byron Bay on it wow so, <laughs> so obviously <laughs> obviously I quite liked it last time I came as well um so yeah so we literally just Put down roots and it was the middle of the GFC we had no contacts we had nowhere to live we had no jobs we had absolutely nothing so it was kind of um you know it was, it was kind of literally starting from nothing but we you know we we got a job through the BER um you know we set up practice and got a got a school project through the BER program that was running at the time and got a private house and then we just sort of took it from there 
Great. Wow. What a leap of faith. That's awesome. Yeah, that's excellent. <laughs> what about you? How did you end up in Cairns? So you started in Cairns and ended up in Cairns. What happened in the middle? Yeah, totally. So I grew up in Cairns and like um, a fair few regionally uh, based kids I know, I was like, yep, I'm leaving and I'm never coming back. <laughs> and that was it. Um, but no, I, uh, uh, so it, there was no way I could study up here, um, not architecture. And uh, so went to South Australia um, to study at UniSA down there, which was a great school. I really enjoyed that. Um, and then uh, was planning on, me and my partner were planning on moving to New Zealand from there. We wanted to go and spend some time over there, but uh, kind of got halfway there and landed in Melbourne. Um, and so spent, spent a fair bit of time in Melbourne, kind of cutting my teeth down there, which was great fun. And I was totally um, enamoured with being in Melbourne. I, I really had a great time there, um, doing a lot of different projects. But then uh, my mum got sick, actually, and so it was a completely a complete sideswipe that I didn't didn't imagine was going to happen. And you know, the last thing on my radar is a twenty-something year old being like, you know, well to my feet, kind of just going up, feeling pretty good about it, um, and then moved back to Cairns to be with her, which has turned out, you know, terrible circumstance at the time, but it's turned out to be an amazing kind of return to a place where I don't think you I don't think I realized growing up um how much kind of innate knowledge you have of a place when you grow up there and I think Kansas has got such amazing quirks and um such an incredible beauty to the environment and the climate is so ever present and so is the rainforest and so much of that influences every day and how we practice and so practicing in Cairns feels like it feels like almost where it should be in some ways like it it it's all these things that um, I never thought would inform how I practice but completely do on it every day so it's been a, um it was a bit tough to begin with but it, it's been I've landed on my feet and pod um, and people oriented design do some great projects. We don't just work in Cairns, we work across Cape York and a lot of Queensland. So it's it's a great way to be able to see and be and meet lots of different people up this way, working regionally. Yeah, yeah. So landed back here. Yeah. Yeah. And glad about yeah. it. Excellent. Mm, yeah, yeah. So that kind of brings us on to our, our next kind of um, thing we wanted to raise, which is what do you see as the benefits of regional practice? Mm. And you sort of just touched on that. Do you want to do you want to keep going? Because you're doing a great job with that one. <laughs> sure. The benefits of regional practice. I was talking um, about this the other day with someone and um, saying that I feel like the conversation like because the architecture community here is a lot smaller and the the region we work with is so big and there are so many we are constantly um, working with people from such different backgrounds and such different histories and such different places than our own I feel like we are so influenced by everything outside of architecture so I feel like the the climate um, the the immense different histories, um, indigenous histories, um, migrant histories um, of the places that we work in are so varied across North Queensland that I feel like that is a constant influence. Um, and it's I find that a real benefit. So we're constantly looking at the climate. So automatically you're thinking about sustainability all the time and in, in how can you actually live in a place that for a lot of the year is um, is magnificent, but that there are it is a pretty solid wet season that we have in every year and you know, Cape York shuts down. So it feels like there is a lot of external influences that always um, we're constantly talking about. Whereas I think when I was practicing down south in Melbourne, there's this beauty of the mass of architects that generate this incredible conversations about what architecture is and about what design is. And it's almost like that is then influencing outwards. And I feel like in the regions we're being influenced in the opposite way. Like it's kind of everything else is influencing our practice. Yeah, so it's, yeah, I think that's the benefit I see of, of um, being in the regions. 
yeah for me probably personally yeah how about yourself Byron Bay yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, you can imagine, you know, I'm a, I'm a city girl through and through, you know, I'm from London, I lived in Brazil and Saudi Arabia and Hong Kong as a kid, so I was never out of cities. And so suddenly to be, um, make the decision to come to regional, New, you know, New South Wales or any regional place was, was a massive leap for me. And I was like, okay, well, we'll see how this goes. Um, and I mean, Byron Bay, it's, it's it's like a little city i mean one of the things that really appealed to me about it was you walk down the street and there's just people speaking french and german and italian and spanish and you know there's cinema and restaurants and you know it it feels very metropolitan even though it's obviously a, a very small town um so for me the the sort of benefits of particularly being here but um is you know you feel i mean i share your connection with the natural environment i think if you practice regionally and you don't feel that very very strong connection with your natural environment then I think you might be missing something mm -hmm. um, and it is it's quite different to practicing in a city you know you, you really are very um, very connected with it I mean quite often the sites are rural or hinterland or, or heavily coastal so you know if you don't take that into account it, you know it's such a massive part of the design and the you know the 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 you know what you do and 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 you can't possibly ignore it i mean i can't imagine anyone who does ignore it but you can see buildings where people have ignored the climate or have you know come or designed it elsewhere and just kind of you know posted it off i guess and you can see the buildings and they just look like alien things sitting in the landscape they just don't they just don't you know sort of resonate with the with their surroundings or the climate and you know as a consequence you know then they become not loved buildings and people you know sort of say oh i used to own that you know that house or that building and i really hated living there and you know and you go well you know it's, it's interesting because you go past and you go well oh, that looks kind of pretty out of place and then you find out that actually it's horrible to live in as well so it, you know that that sort of connection with with the context and the climate is so incredibly important and and i i, I don't think you can successfully practice regionally without it i think it's really critical so i think that is a really lovely thing and it's you know it, it's it's not hard to feel that connection you know you kind of um go out and about on site and you know it, it's you might go from one site on a coastal headland to another site on a you know um hinterland valley or or whatever and it's you know it's really really stunning and sometimes the 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 places or the the aspects of somewhere that you think you're going to love like the if something has both a coastal view and a hinterland view you think oh you know the coastal view is going to be the hero you know it's going to be really amazing and actually the quality of light coming across the hills in the hinterland is actually much nicer than the coastal view so the thing that you think might be which is probably the thing that the the house would be sold on oh you know amazing view of byron lighthouse or whatever but actually you look the other way and you see this hinterland and you see the light coming across it or you see the storm rolling over the hill or whatever and, it, and it's it's actually more powerful than than the sort of headline um view i guess so that that's kind of been quite a lovely thing to to sort of understand um, with sightings of buildings and and you know how how things work from that that perspective but i guess in terms of practice you know i practice with my husband so um uh we have a practice of five or six people and we have two children and for me regional practice has meant that we could practice together which we always wanted to do and also it means that we could be flexible when our kids were young they're now teenagers so it's a little bit easier but um you know they obviously still have school holidays and they still need entertaining and and so it's meant that we can run the practice more as a family because we're not spending an hour and a half traveling to work each way and back and you know it's it's kind of now about nine minutes to work and you know that's that feels pretty easy and good and you know it it means that we can all do our sport and our activities and still get a full day's work in and it, it feels very much that that's much easier to pull off in the regions than it would be in a city when you've got that much more time spent just you know making your day work i guess and living further from work and um and having to do that sort of travel thing so I, for me that's that's been a real benefit to um i mean we always get always get asked as women you know how do you do it how do you mm -hmm. run a practice and how do you work and how do you have children and and a, and a partner and and i think that's one of the ways that we have been able to make it work we've designed our lives so that we can have our practice together and have our children and so and they are totally you know mesh so everybody in the office knows who the kids are you know because it's yeah, not that they're in out all the time but you know they're phoning up or they're popping in or you know the dog's in or out or you know so it's very it, there is 
I guess, less separation between private and, and professional, but at the same time, you know, that's how we've chosen to make it work. So yeah. Um, yeah. I think that would have been much harder to pull off in a city. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Could I ask you a bit more about how, um, and this is going a bit off cuff from what we've, we've talked about, but um, you talked a lot about the change. Well, I'm interested to know how you found the change to start designing in a place that was so different from your urban um, kind of training or like where, or and also where you practiced previously. And like you talk about um, exactly the environment being so different and um, how you started to think about that when you when you first landed in Byron and how long you felt like it took to feel like you were feeling it or like it was it was being coming out the way you wanted it perhaps or suited Byron. Mm. Well one of the first things that I really felt very strongly when I when we thought we were moving to Australia I thought oh you know this is going to be easy you know I speak the language and you know I sort of understand the you know the sort of culture a bit and you know legal systems very similar and you know this is going to be a fairly easy assimilation rather than moving somewhere like Hong Kong or Saudi Arabia yeah. which is obviously much harder but actually what I found I was I was very surprised when I moved here I didn't find it easy at all I arrived and I was just like I don't know any of the previous prime ministers I don't know where the food comes from I don't understand the topography of the place and that's really why we decided to spend seven months driving around Australia in a caravan was really so I could get my bearings so I could really understand you know, you go to the supermarket, there's always cheese. It was like, means nothing to me. Vega, cheese. I had no idea that Vega's a place. You know, it's just, it was just meaningless. And I was just like this, I can't, you know, I need to, I need to know where the cheese comes from. Um, and, and so by literally driving around and going to these places, we could understand, or I could understand more, you know, uh, the, the culture, I guess, and the topography mm. and the climate and all of that stuff. So there was, a, there was definitely that that was definitely a really important part of my learning curve when we arrived. Um, and also, obviously, I was in practice with Jason, so he is, he's a native Australian in the sense that he was born here and grew up here and, and was educated here. And so he, um, he, you know, he was obviously all across it. But yeah, there was a, definitely a, a massive learning curve for me because, you know, we build things in brick in, <laughs> in England. And um, and you know we kind of make them airtight and and you know they they need to hold in heat whereas here of course i live in a, a very drafty old timber cottage and one of the great things about it is it's very very not airtight which is one of the things that keeps it cool so you know it was literally everything was turned on its head including where the sun position was you know in england you you really um look for south facing things because that's where the sun comes from with her here obviously you're going oh yeah the sun's facing north so it literally was I used to say oh, I've got my head on upside down you know I literally had my head on upside down some of the times and, and it, it takes a while to kind of override all that stuff and now I don't remember I had to really think about that but now it's it's hard to remember what I used to know what you know and 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 it it does it's, it's just like overwriting file you know the things you know about where the sun comes and goes and and how walls are made and I have to say it's kind of easier here it's quite hard to cut a hole in the wall to put a window in England because it's kind of you know brick but here it's you know you literally just say to the builder I'll have it there please and, <laughs> cut a hole and pop in goes the window it's just like oh that was easy so there's you know there's been there's been some things which have been delightful um but yeah there was a there was a massive learning curve and as I say it was it was much easier for me because I was in practice with Jason and, and he was very much across it so um yeah it's it's taken a while i mean we've been in practice sort of here 12 or 13 years now and it's you know i still feel every single day like i have no idea what i'm doing and i genuinely you know go to work thinking god you know what's going to come up today <laughs> yeah, yeah. there's always something you know but i guess that's again that's the nature of regional practices you, you're mm -hmm. sort of like the gp of architecture you take on whatever comes through the door and it can be anything walks through the door and you know, if somebody comes up with a good idea or a great proposition, you're completely mad to turn it down. And so you could be doing, you know, a school one day and houses the next and a master plan the next and, and literally public art. And these are all the things that we've done since we've been here that, you know, you just kind of go, well, it's a, you know, as architects, we're, 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 um, we developed a, a, a very transferable skill set and you <laughs> literally some days you're just hopping from you know one thing to another to another which suits me because I, I hate routine and I 
you know, would get very bored um, if it was the same every day, every day, but it's, you know, it's really not. We've had mm -hmm. over the 12 or 13 years, we've had, you know, quite a, a broad selection of work and, and clients and sites. And that's, you know, it's been really interesting. Completely. Sometimes I think it's a little bit like method acting. You're like, right, who are you kind of going to join? You've got to kind of, you know, let, think about uh, immersing yourself into that that sphere of being. And you're exactly right. We find it up here that the diversity of what we're working on is is phenomenal. We're working with, we did a project, we were working with um, uh, cattle farmers in Boulia, uh, Central Western Queensland, while working with people at the Torres Strait on a land and sea ranges project. It's, it's totally diverse, which is what completely makes it, um, I guess, if we come back to the benefits of regional practice, I think that that's um, definitely a, it keeps it interesting. And I feel like the, the sharpening of your tool sets to um, rely uh, more on the in-house knowledge as well um, in terms of like the nuts and bolts and how things physically go together. I feel like my construction knowledge has gone up significantly um, just in the sheer nature of needing to know how things go together up here and the, um, the pools of knowledge that we're drawing from and things. There's definitely very, very skilled people that's up here that's not to diminish that at all. But I feel like I've had to really step up in that in certain ways to kind of um yeah understand the nuts and bolts a lot more on a, a vast array of projects it's, yeah it keeps it interesting yeah it keeps yeah. you thinking that's for sure yeah it's interesting um me and my partner have just come back from five months uh in a car touring around australia so i wonder if that's <laughs> you know and since working up here perhaps that's become more of a I think COVID also contributed to that being a, where we could go. But um, yeah, touring around and seeing the, the vernacular of, of what's going on and connecting the dots through regional Australia and through how Queensland um, meets the Northern Territory and, and, and how things change in the subtle, like subtle but beautiful landscapes and how they carry through Australia. And then how, you know, a little shed here and a little shed there and it is all responding to those different environments and it, it was we loved it it was a it was a great way of i think also understanding our patch too so yeah it's interesting that you yeah we really enjoy yeah, i always i always love looking at those little sheds and on where old houses are sited because mm -hmm. they're they're invariably sited in the most incredibly intelligent places and when you know someone says oh i've bought this piece of land and you know there's this house on it but I want to put the house over there and you're like mm -hmm. let's examine that a little bit closer and then you know and the the whoever it was who decided where that little old cottage was going to go it's like actually do you know what it's not such a bad spot it may not have the hero view or whatever but you know it's actually really protected from southerly it gets really good morning light it's going to keep the light a long time in winter you know and actually all of this stuff's been really really thought mm. about and that that little that little house or that little cottage or whatever has actually been really you know it's really smart it's something that peter started we said absolutely years ago he said you know i go on site and i i i you know live on site for two days so that i can really get to understand it and he said and invariably i think i want to put it where that little cottage is <laughs> yeah, completely, completely. someone's done the thinking about that and i love seeing how so queenslanders and things evolve over time you go to somewhere like longreach or winton and i love just driving the back streets and looking at queenslanders and the awnings that have been added on to awnings that have been added onto front porches <laughs> More on it. it's, so, it's this beautiful kind of progression and it's completely yeah totally responsive in that way yeah yeah there's there's things to be learned from the little nuts and bolts out there they're great yeah, yeah for sure so ellen what do you reckon are the downsides of practicing regionally can you think of any so the advent of COVID and everyone realizing that we can do things over Zoom, such as right now, is really amazing. And I feel like that connection to broader conversations sometimes. Um, I try hard to be involved with them, but because they're not literally happening down the road, uh, sometimes it can be more challenging. I think, um, yeah, the advent of COVID and uh, Zoom and people being connected in this way is certainly a silver lining that has come out of the scenario. Um, I think it, 
sometimes it can be really tough in the in the purely kind of budgetary uh, and physical kind of requirements of uh, of being so far away. So things like um, if we're working up in Cape York, we are looking at the sizes of all our materials that are going somewhere. We are looking at uh, when the barges are running. We're only con in construction for certain months of a year before the rains come through and block off all the roads. Um, and sometimes not being able to get to site very regularly because it is in a location that's in the Torres Strait or quite far away is, um, is hard and we, in those, locations sometimes become the fly in fly out architect as well we try very hard not to be that but because of the geography of where we are you kind of um it's it's inevitable to a certain extent but i think there are also kind of some of the the beautiful bits of it too so it's like a day when you're kind of bashing your head against a wall trying to sort something out and figure it out between someone in brisbane who's giving you the paint spec and then thinking about you know the torres or like somewhere in thursday island where you're trying to design something you kind of feel like you're being pulled in two directions but it's um there's a lot of learning that comes out of it as well but it can be yeah it can be a challenge too yeah i think yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I th I think our our um our experience practice is, is less extreme than that for sure because yeah. most of our work is very local and that's you know no one could pretend that was hard. We've got you know loads of good builders. We've got good suppliers. We've got good manufacturers around. So you know occasionally you sort of hit a stumbling block where there's no decent tilers or the window man manufacturers yeah. aren't coming up to scratch or something but you know generally we're pretty lucky with that kind of thing we certainly don't deal with the kind of extreme logistics that that you're yeah. describing there having um, a bit of a to lay face block work can sometimes be a challenge <laughs> so, yeah. yeah i think it sounds like we're we're pretty lucky yeah um, <laughs> I, I guess one of our i guess one of our challenges particularly at the moment is recruitment so we mm. um uh it's we have oh, there are three or four um, uh, universities that, that do architecture in southeast Queensland. So there's so there's you know it, it's it's uh, well supplied in that sense. But obviously, you know that's at least hour and a half, two hours drive south to get to us. Um, and so it kind of and and if anyone's come from anywhere else, it requires relocation. And we've got a major housing prices up here at the moment because you've probably all just seen everywhere that Byron has gone crazy and um, it's it's always been popular but it's suddenly become wildly popular and and the housing is a real a genuine problem and um there's a lot of investment buying has always gone on but it's definitely going on now and so we we're struggling at the moment um to find people not not because they're not around but because they they accept the offer of employment and then say subjects finding somewhere to live and then they really can't find anywhere um uh, there are places to live but do you you know are you really going to relocate somewhere and live somewhere that you're not that wild about so it's 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 been genuinely difficult and I, I don't think that you know the New South Wales government or you know probably anybody outside Byron really understands how bad it is and how much it's you know it's it's kind of affecting the economy and affecting people who you know it's not it's not just architecture practice of course it's you know everybody who once their coffee poured or once their dinner served or you know the house cleaned or whatever you know their taxis driven it you know there's many 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 jobs that rely on there being a, a decent supply of, of relatively affordable housing it's never been affordable here but you know relatively affordable housing and certainly housing diversity i think that's another major mm -hmm. issue you know there's lots of big houses with big gardens here but but you know that's that doesn't make it affordable and and it's really becoming in the last 12 months it's really become quite extreme so that that's been a major issue for us and, and many other businesses um locally um so i guess that that's one of our major things i think the other thing you touched upon which i think is really really true is the um you know in in london it was always you could go out any night of the week and go to something and chat to people and friday night drinks in the pub were an absolute certainty whereas you know regionally you don't if you i mean we're we're lucky we have practice five or six people um we've got another guy who is in the office upstairs um and there are lots of practices uh, in byron so there are people around if we need to talk to them but you don't get that sort of just 
casual interaction that it's not even networking it's just that casual interaction the kind of chats that we're having tonight and that we've been having this week mm. just about archy stuff you know just just Absolutely. nothing particularly major just archy chat and yeah. you know it's the kind of stuff that you go go to the pub after work or go out for drinks or something and and chat to the people at work for an hour or two and then go home and it, it's kind of um you know it's resolved it's out of your system but it, it's yeah. quite difficult um particularly for people who us you know sole practitioners um regionally it's very very hard for them to have that kind of interaction so um what ali was alluding to earlier about pro bono work was um i was chair of country division for four years which is the new south wales country division division of the australian institute of architects and that was one of the um really important functions of that was was to bring people together across the whole um across the whole state and and we ran in in-person events pre-covid um because it was just super important that people came together for a few days and had the opportunity mm -hmm. just to hang out with each other and just hang around together and chat over lunch and dinner and you know mm -hmm. and and everybody it was something that every single person spoke about was just oh we just really miss this you know talking to other architects about kind of what everyone else you know would would think is absolute drivel but you know to us it's really interesting and and you know important to have those conversations so i think that's that's a real challenge regionally is to make sure that you do have those networks and connections that you can um have those sort of casual conversations yeah completely completely um in in our office a lot of us are kind of involved in the institute um it, it with brisbane and, um or at a larger level just to so that we do have those conversations kind of you know and keep our finger on the pulse and understand what's going on in a broader context as well i find it incredibly beneficial to to have the to be able to have access to those chats i have uh feel very healthy because i'm at the pub a lot less than i was <laughs> I'm on every corner, but um, completely, no, 100% agree. I think um, that's one of the things that has been a bit tougher. And it's nice, our practice has got a bit bigger lately, and it's it's lovely having those like um, broader chats to the to the other people in the office and things. But yeah, we are all quite connected uh, to other conversations, exactly like you were talking about with the country division in, in New South Wales. It, it, it helps, and I think. Um, it's nice uh, not being sometimes the only person on Zoom in a in like a meeting. It's it's nice when everyone else is, and you're like, oh, I don't feel like I've got a hearing impediment. <laughs> Everyone's That's on right. the same level. It's a really it's yeah, yeah. Zoom is I can't can't thank Zoom enough. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think I think that has been a major. It's again, I agree with the major thing for us is you know, not being the only person on Zoom. You know, everybody's mm. in a room together chatting and you really can't hear because everybody's, you know, as conversations naturally flow, people are talking over each other and chipping in and two people yeah. might be having a side conversation and, and whatever, which works okay in a meeting. But, you know, when you're on the other end of a phone line, not even with video link and you just think, I just, all I can hear is chatting and buzzing and somebody tapping their pen on the table and that's all you can hear as <laughs> well wow, this is impossible um, so yeah it's really it's really good a bit of equity on over zoom mm -hmm. is, has been fantastic yeah completely so you have a lot of women in your practice in byron bay you're quite um is, was that an intentional kind of uh, how's the gender parity in your office kind of come about yeah so we yeah, we've currently got 80% women, um, which is like probably like my journey through architecture, totally unintentional. Um, basically, Jason's the only only bloke that we've got and he can't go anywhere because he's married to me. So he's stuck. Um, and we, you know, we genuinely recruit on skill set. Like we have no gender agenda at all. Gender agenda. Oh, my goodness. Um, there's no there, there's no intention there to either um, employ women or men it, it's literally whoever um whoever's available has the right skill set and fits the the skills we're looking for so we, we've never kind of had a gender profile or a or a sort of target if, if you like and i guess our our over the time that we've practiced our our gender split has gone probably 65 percent male um all the way through to now 80% female. So, and it, it very much with a small practice, it only takes one or, one or two people to leave and your gender balance completely flips the other way. Mm. Um, so interestingly, we did um, try and employ two people recently, both of whom were men. Um, so that would, that would have 
taken our average the other way a little bit. Um, but no, it's not intentional. And, and people sometimes walk in the office and go, whoa, what's, go what's going on here? You kind of sucked up all the women in architecture in the whole shire, um, which is not quite true. But, um, but we certainly have a, a fair proportion of them. And it, you know, it's, it's, I just think, my goodness, how many offices have I worked in where I've been not the only woman, but, you know, definitely in the minority. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, and now are the boots on the other foot and it's completely fine. I mean, Jason couldn't care less. I mean, you know, it's, it doesn't bother him at all. Um, yeah. But, it, you know, it's it's lovely and, and it is genuinely based on who fits into the office um, and there, there's no issue and it, they could equally well be men and it's really not an issue. But they, you know, they have skills that we need and they have they have the, the attitude that makes a small practice um, work, which is really important. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's nowhere to hide in a practice that small we're all pretty jammed in so um so yeah it's it's not intentional I'm, I'm I don't pretend that I don't like it but it, it's not intentional at all now and it could it could change as well so I'm enjoying it while I can yeah great yeah awesome yeah we have a um a lot of women in our office too we have um Michael who's the one guy in our office who um yeah, and I think it, I don't think it was an intentional thing. And Cairns, oddly, um, there is a really high proportion. I think, uh, well, I can't remember the quote, but the, Justine, you can probably chime in here, but the um, proportion of women practicing as architects in Cairns is, I think it's up to like 40% or something mm. like that. It's really high. Wow. Um, it's quite phenomenal. And a lot of sole practitioners, a lot of, um, you know, bigger companies that have, have women at the helm which is great and um there seems to be in those practices a larger proportion of women as well which i don't i don't think it's intentional but i think that there's probably something in that in the kind of um, gravitational pull perhaps um but yeah i worked previously in a practice with four male directors and i now have two female directors and i got amazing things out of both um i think the the empathy level in our office is quite high, which is phenomenal. Um, I think especially with what I touched on before with my mum, it was very, like, very incredibly helpful to have such supportive um, bosses who, I don't know whether that's purely their gender, I don't think so, but um, I do think that it is incredibly supportive environment here and whether that plays into it as well, I'm sure, in some levels it does, yeah. Yeah, but no, it's a great, great office with lots of women and, I, yeah, I don't think it was intentional, but I think there's, um, yeah, with that, with what you mentioned before of, uh, you know, working in an architectural practice with mostly men, there's, n there's not usually, a, it's not pointed out as readily as when we have three or four women walk up on site and it's, it's quite often commented on. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, so we do have a couple of questions, but is oh there something you wanted to finish? No, on? no, no you're oh, that's great. Take questions. Just make them easy ones, please. <laughs> <laughs> the first one, well, the one that's here for is from Samira. Um, She's got the great wallpaper. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Unmute yourself, Samira, and ask your question. Okay. Yeah, uh, I wanted to know whether you have any advice for newcomer immigrant architects uh, to Australia. Uh, any tip or something which might help? I kind, of, I kind of got that you're breaking up, but I think I've got enough of it. Um, tips for newcomers, immigrant newcomer architects. Um, probably nothing particularly helpful. I mean, I, I, I think my sort of passage here was definitely eased by practicing with um, an Australian so and and obviously him being my husband so he kind of had to put up with all my dark questions and you know be quite patient with me um but I think that that's super helpful so I mean I guess if you unless you can marry an Australian architect which is probably not not um ideal for everybody is you know kind of hang out find you know not not practice on your own but but hang out with um Australian architects and just kind of <laughs> follow them around and suck all the knowledge out of them until until you kind of feel more comfortable I mean the building technology and the building regs and all of that you know planning law all of that stuff is you know is different obviously um and there's no substitute for just learning that you know that just takes a while to to get your head around it and learn it and and you know 
really understand it through practice. I guess also just um, working with really good consultants. You know, we're, we're lucky here. It took us a little while to find a structural engineer that we really like, but we have got one who's very creative and, and again, doesn't do that thing, the, the sarcastic kind of, oh my God, I can't believe you don't know that kind of attitude, which is like, hey, dude, I don't need any help feeling crap about myself. You know, I can do that myself. I need you to be, you know, understanding and supportive. And, you know, so we literally picked our, our consultants based on skills and attitude. So, um, you know, it was very much around, we want to work creatively with you, we want to work closely with you, we want to work genuinely collaboratively with you. We expect you to um, come in with an open mind and an open heart and to, you know, work with us um, honestly and effectively. And we found that, you know, we've got great consultants who we just really adore working with. And it's such a lovely way of working. Um, and there's none of that sort of wake up in the morning dreading going to work. It's not at all, you know, it's really, um, it's really fun and and it's it you know i i don't i've never believed that there's any such thing as a stupid question or that you, you know i've sat in, i cannot tell you how many meetings i've sat in big meetings where there's been 20 blokes and me and i've just thought god i've got no idea what they're talking about and i've just <laughs> said oh, sorry can i interrupt I, I actually don't understand that. What is that acronym or that reference or whatever? And nobody around the table has been able to tell me apart from the person talking. And it's like, I just cannot tell you the number of times that's happened. And I've just thought, actually, do you know what? Every time I don't have a clue what's going on, I'm just going to say, sorry, stop, sorry, no idea. I've no idea what you're talking about. And it's, it's really, try it. It's really enlightening because no one else has a clue either. Um, and actually, you know, the consultants, I, you know, I quite often say to the structure here, sorry, no, I've got no idea what beam, you know, just, just go back a bit, I, you know, and, and it's just it, that I, I can't tell you enough that right from the very beginning, just don't ever worry about asking questions or thinking, you know, you shouldn't appear stupid or that you should really know what they're talking about. It's quite often they're talking riddles anyway. Um, and, and actually communication is a real, is really nuanced. And I found, you know, I've worked in, in Sweden and, and um, France, and when we were working in France, we were working in French. Um, have a very good repertoire of swear words, by the way, um, in French, um, but not much else that's useful. Um, have words like tile trim and things like that in my repertoire, but if you try and chat me up in a bar, I'm hopeless. Um, <laughs> And, you know, so, so you really understand then that the, the nuance of language, how important that is. And, and um, you know, then you can imagine how many times you stop meeting me and I stop, stop. I've got no idea what you're talking about. What's that word? Um, and, and it's really, um, I quite often find when builders phone up, for example, they're talking about something and they're blah, 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 blah. And I was like, oh, okay, you've lost me now. Can you FaceTime me or send me a photo of that or something? Because, you know, quite often they're away and I can't get to them or whatever. Um, and that that sort of really detailed specific communication even in your own language can be really quite difficult when you can't see what they're talking about because they're standing on site pointing at something and obviously you can't see what on earth they're doing um, and and I, I would really um, not just if you're a, a new person into the country but generally if you're if you're new to the um, new to the project or new to the profession I would 100% recommend you just ask questions all the time and never ever be afraid to um, to get things clarified if, if they're not clear and you will find that you're not the only person who really has no idea what's going on um, and then and I find that you get much better relationships with people much more robust um, forms of communication and channels of communication and also you get to know how people communicate so if you work with that person again you understand how they use language and and what they find difficult to explain and ways around um, that so that you can communicate effectively. And I think that's, that's in our profession, that's just super, super important. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Because I feel like you could just pop yourself off on mute if you wanted to. Um, otherwise, maybe Justine or Ali, I certainly have a couple of questions I could ask. Well, I, I wonder if, um building on on that uh, on Sarah's response to that question I wondered um, what Alan might advice Alan might have to those entering practice you know it, it, perhaps as coming from elsewhere but just as kind of new graduates also 
certainly one of the um, things that keeps coming up again and again with power is the, um, uh, the sort of uh, appreciation of people passing on kind of advice about, you know, getting going. So I wondered if Alan might have mm -hmm. things to say. Mm -hmm. I think what Sarah said was incredibly valuable. I think that it's it's eternally valuable that of not feeling like you're you're a, a deal for asking questions. I think I I certainly have to tell myself that again and again and again. I think um and that's also true to like a persistence in chasing what you're after. I think sometimes when people say, "Oh no, we don't," like I I finished at the end of the GFC. Um, architecture school and and was hunting around for work at that point and and that kind of the nervousness of applying for new jobs and putting yourself out there when you feel like you don't have that much to offer you don't have much experience is is so incredibly nerve wracking but I think it's really helpful to remember that everyone's been in that position like everyone has had to go through that rung of of calling and contacting and being a bit of a hound dog but Honestly, being a bit of a hound dog is kind of what gets you there as well. And asking those questions and just seeing if you can meet people for a chat, people that you admire that you think, oh, I could never really talk to them. We're all human at the end of the day. And I think well, we have all been there. We have all kind of been in that position of, of feeling like we're not quite adequate enough to have those conversations. But it's exactly to what Sarah was going. Um, was saying was like that power of asking is incredibly it kind of shows a um, it's like rocking up with a certain sense of vulnerability to that people really respond to and Sarah also mentioned that nuance of conversation that if you do open yourself up in that way it's almost guaranteed no one's going to slam the door in your face you're kind of coming there with an honest question people are going to to respond in that way and I think that goes with trying to find work or getting your foot in the door or um, try and go for what you are actually after sometimes settling for third best isn't always great like sometimes a bit of persistence and a bit of hound dogging is worthwhile to be able to try and get into the avenues you're after yeah. I think I agree, Ellen, and, and, and I think one of the important things to remember is that when you're trying to go for a position, and it's exactly the same situation if you're an architecture practice going for a client, going for projects, mm. is you may just not be what they're looking for. And it's not, it always feels, you get a rejection, it always feels like a personal comment, I wasn't good enough, you know, what did I do wrong, you know, that's, that you always kind of feels like that, but actually you just weren't the right fit. And it's not, that's not a comment on you or your skills or your personality. It's actually just, you weren't right for that job. You weren't the right person at the right time in the right place. And similarly, when, you know, you go for a, a project or a new client and you're, you're up against other architects, it's not to say that they're better than you or that you won't get the next one. And you kind of have to, I find it quite difficult sometimes, but you have to hold that belief. You have to mm. hold that belief that it's not, it's not a criticism it's it may be a rejection it may be a step back it may be something that you really wanted that you can't have which is always a very difficult thing to swallow but it's not necessarily a negative comment about you it just isn't the right fit and we always say to clients um even though we obviously really hope that they'll choose us we always say to clients look you've got to be really comfortable with who you work with because it's really important that you are comfortable and open and honest and can have really good conversations with the person who designs your house building whatever it is um, and if you don't feel comfortable with that person it, it really won't work like if, if at the beginning you don't feel comfortable you really have reservations about that person the project will not be a success because mm. you need to be comfortable and confident that you can have a good robust relationship with that person or those people to make it work and that i really feel the very the same is very much true about getting a job and working in practice you know you might be great at your job practice might be great but if you don't fit together well you don't really enjoy going to work every day you're just not going to be happy and comfortable and it doesn't mean that you won't do good work for that practice but it you know if you don't feel fulfilled and and they don't feel like you're a comfortable fit it just isn't going to work in the end it's just not sustainable and eventually you're going to you know leave or whatever so i would i would definitely say to people i would agree with you go for what you want be quite committed to it also be open-minded to change of direction you know sometimes when you're going for something 
um, things don't pan out, but actually other things crop up and you think, oh, actually that wasn't really what I was looking for, but you know, that could be interesting. And then you sort of diverge and go somewhere else, but that, that somewhere else can actually take you more intuitively where, where, you, where you want to be. So um, I would be very committed and also be, be quite open-minded about it, but also hold, hold firm. It's, it's not always a comment about you or your skills. It's not always to be taken negatively. And I think architecture school kind of sets us up to feeling like that as well. We, you know, we get up and we we are taught to stand up and defend our work and have all the answers to what we've put on the board and can be completely defensive and and supportive of what we put our heart nailed on the wall. It's like um, I think you're exactly right. It's not always a personal comment. There are so many other factors going on that swirl around a practice that may not be that likely not personally attributed to you it's it's uh, um, but yeah having that commitment to kind of beavering away to what you're after but yeah again as well what you said Sarah like I got completely you know I didn't plan to get into architecture I also didn't plan to um, come back to Cairns but both have been decisions that I would not change now because they've taught me so much more than uh, what I'd anticipated that I needed to know and I've learned so much out of you know coming back up here that I a lot of things yeah I didn't realize I needed to know and uh, learn you just learn so much through every new experience I think yeah even if it's not one you anticipated yeah I've I think enough. also even if you sorry Justine um just one more thing if, if you have a you know a role or experience or a project whatever it is which isn't your kind of you know where necessary your heart and soul lies you know it's it's work we're here to work after all and not all work's going to be you know everything you ever hoped for there i think you're right ellen that you can extract things from it you can gain skills from doing it and you can think god that, that's not what i want to spend my time doing but nevertheless i learned this or how to manage that or you know so so even if you are stuck in a place that's maybe not where you want to be or with a client who's being a bit tricky you can still extract loads of really, really good skills and experiences, which you can then use. And even if those those skills and experiences are how not to hook another client like this one, you know, um, or how not to get another job like that, it's it's still those experiences are, are, are really good. So everything, kind of everything you do, there's you can you can just if you keep your eyes open, you can just extract something useful from it. Completely. So I was going to ask um, also. A about the relation, I mean, Sarah, you talked about um, the work you've done with the country division, and, and certainly that's how I first knew about you was all the kind of work you're doing, you know, building communities and organising and um, really kind of making space for um, conversation, which is something very close to my heart and very similar to what we try to do at Parla. Um, so I wonder if you might explain a little bit about how that sort of body of work um, connects to or interacts with or does or doesn't with your kind of life and practice i mean I, i'm sort of interested to know about um how they influence each other or make opportunity for each other i guess i guess one of the things that i've really extracted from the the whole country division experience was um you know i was i was a metro chick you know i was i was heavily kind of you know invested in cities and then came to the regions and then um, you know, became very involved and, and very vocal about regional practice and regional networking and um, became very much a committed regionalist. And I think for me, that's been, a, that's been a major, not a change, it just wasn't something that I was involved with before because I wasn't living regionally. But um, I guess that, that commitment to the regions and also the understanding of how we are largely ignored by the very metrocentric governments um, and COVID really spelt that out if it wasn't already evident that, you know, really, we can't hear you, <laughs> you know, you're outside the, the CBD and, and we really can't hear a word you're saying. Um, and that, that, again, that's quite hard to swallow, you know, that's pretty difficult um, to, um, to accept having spent all my life in cities where everyone in cities is, is very much a, a kind of, um, in in the eyes of of the you know under the nose of the government and and the the interests of the city are very much um central to all the policy and and all of that stuff and then you become regional and really you know it's it's as if you don't exist and that that's that's quite difficult i think 
whether it's informed our practice, I guess it has. I mean, we we were founding members of a group called the, the Design Advisory Panel, which we made that name up, um, which is very different from the kind of official design advisory panels that you have in kind of Sydney and and, and Sunshine Coast and things. Um, which was basically we were a, a group of building professionals. So we were architects, landscape architects, um, public artists, um, environmental um, engineers. And there, there isn't anywhere in regional, um, certainly northern New South Wales, um, a company, a, a practice that has all of those skills. And so we set up this group that only took on pro bono work. And so you couldn't buy our skills, they weren't for sale. And so we used um, our collective skills to do pro bono, pro bono work for community projects. So for example, a council goes to a, a community and says, right, we've got you know $3 million of funding to do things within your community. What do you want to do? And of course the community goes, nah, we don't know, or we need new shower, or we want a pedestrian crossing or whatever it is. And there's kind of a few disparate kind of shouty voices in in the in the sidelines but there's no as you would imagine with the community there's no ability within that community to get a coherent plan together and to, to also have a vision beyond the showers not working the potholes or whatever and say look this is three million bucks what can we do with this for the benefit of the community and have that sort of broader community base of consultation and strategic planning and so we do we just took all of those skills you know the broad skills of the group and and literally only applied them to community projects and we had developers coming up to us saying um right so um we've got this development and the council's told us to do community consultation we want to employ your group to help us and we were like yeah sorry it doesn't work like that we're we're not for sale well how much can i give you i'll make a donation no <laughs> no you're not hearing me we're not for sale we're not doing it we only do it for communities and they absolutely couldn't grasp that that those skills were only available free and that we wouldn't sell them and that you couldn't buy them on the open market because there is no practice that has those skills. So we used to find this quite entertaining. Um, and you know, and that, that group went for a few years and it was really, um, it was really good and we really enjoyed it and we felt like we, we got some really good traction. I mean, we, we did upset a few people, namely the council, um, by, you know, we, we would make a, uh, they would issue a draft DCP and we would make a submission that was kind of, you know, 100 pages long and of course, we, you know, we had planners and architects and, you know, landscape architects and environmental engineers on board. And so we were kind of like just gave them this, you know, multidisciplinary kind of document feedback. And they'd be like, whoa. <laughs> um, but again, we felt it was, you know, on behalf of the community, keeping the, the council honest and giving them the kind of feedback that they the coordinated um, feedback that they would never get um, from the community otherwise. So. Um, I guess I guess that that's that's kind of something that was very integral to our practice very early on, and, and we felt very passionately about that. And and I guess um, we also did quite a bit of community consultation when we did the Byron Bay Master Plan. So again, that was very much it was a it was deliberately a grassroots up project. So it wasn't do the master plan and ask them what they think. It was like, hey, we haven't done anything. What do you think? And then it was literally built on that community consultation. So that was a really that was a really great project to be involved in and, and a really good process and unfortunately the council seems to have forgotten everything we taught them about community consulta consultation which is it, consultation is not the same as notification you don't do it and notify people you actually ask them first for the brief and then you go and do it and they I think they've completely forgotten that but um, but I think that's really informed maybe the way we practice we're very much around we don't have a, a strict agenda we very much speak to every client on a on a individual basis we, we we literally start from nothing with every single client um and and very much develop it around them and their family and you know their needs and the site and that kind of thing and, and it, we really enjoy working that way it feels very sort of quite labor intensive i guess but but quite fresh and special sounds fascinating <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yes. How many right. people do, do you work with in that context, Sarah? Are there, is there quite a bunch of you? Um, there are lots of. Um, my husband asked me if I'd like some dinner. <laughs> um, <laughs> there are there are lots of architects in Byron. I mean, I think it's one of the few regional places you can go where you walk down the street and probably every fifth person you trip over it is an architect. It's quite extraordinary, and I think everyone's here for the same reason. You know, it, it's beautiful, um, but also that you know 
or one of the things I didn't touch on earlier about one of the probably the bad things about practicing regionally is you're very um, dependent on the economy. So if the local economy isn't strong or there's a massive downturn, take for example the GFC or COVID, um, you are you know your practice can literally turn on its head um, very quickly. So um, it is important to practice somewhere that has a, a fairly strong and preferably diverse economy. Um, but Rohanna, I think you've got the same mug as me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just saw that go past and oh, that looks familiar. Cool. Um, so I've lost my train of thought now. Um, so I, th I, think, I think that's one of the things is the, the economy is very important to small practice and, and literally if it contracts, then a lot of those architects can find themselves in, in you know, very much underemployed very quickly. Um, I think Byron has a reasonably strong economy, even though it's not diverse, it's mainly based around tourism um, and housing, exp expensive housing. Um, and it could do with more diversification and we do have more sort of food production and, and you know, high end food production around here now, which is really good. Um, but it does tend to be fairly, um, you know, one or two track economy, which is, isn't brilliant in those downturn times. So there are a lot of architects and, and but this, you find that the size of those practices shrink quite dramatically in times of economic downturn. Which isn't our situation at the moment. We're all mad busy. <laughs> I think we'll, yeah, we'll go into the breakout rooms now, but I think we'll keep them, um, we'll, have, we'll just have a couple, so um, we can kind of continue this conversation in a more um, three-dimensional way with everybody. Um, but I just want to first of all um, acknowledge and thank our sponsors again. Um, uh, Fajan from AWS was here, but he has been texting me. He's been having trouble with his connection, as, as have some of the others, so he's not here. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge again um, AWS uh, and our other sponsors as well. Um, so thank you very much. So let's just um, do a little round of clapping, I think, for our fabulous speakers. Thank you, Sarah and Ellen. Thanks thank for having us. us. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's been really fun. Yeah, it's been really fun, good. Ellen, to get to know you as well. You too, Sarah. Yeah, definitely.